The first thing I want to do, just so I have a record of it, uh, if you could just give me your first and last name and the correct spelling of it, so I have it on tape. All uh, right. You ready? Yes. Uh, Harold Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T. The proper way. Uh, Let me do one other thing. Uh, what, um, let's, I'm going to back up a little bit mm -hmm. and, and start with a little bit before the war. The Depression. Well, Depression. I was born on July the 23rd, 1927. That was right in the Depression. And uh, I was the last of my father's sons. He had four other ones, uh, th th three other sons and two daughters uh, by, between two marriages. And uh, my mother then, his first wife died in 1925. He married my mother in 26 and then had a sister, my sister, and me in 27. And then in 1929, my mother passed away in February. And in May of 29, he killed himself because of all this turmoil that he was going through. And uh, it was in a deep depression. And uh, as a young kid, I was thrashed amongst everybody else into an orphanage. And uh, <laughs> we were, lived a sheltered life. Everybody took care of us and looked after us and everything else. We didn't have a care in the world. People donated and, and uh, we may have uh, worn oversized clothes or whatever, but we lived a life. We had three meals a day. It may not have been steak and eggs, but it was meals. We had to get up three o'clock in the morning and go to bakeries and and uh, somebody had begged before us, and we'd come back to the home with baskets full of bread and donuts and biscuits and everything. In the afternoon, we'd have to go and to the little grocery stores, and they'd give us the leftovers. Of the, and we lived. Uh, unfortunately, that life had to come to an end when I was about 13 years old, and the Depression had been over, and times were supposed to be good, but the home didn't have funds to operate. So they looked for us to go with a distant relative, which none wanted us because of the turmoil that was there. And I, they found somebody who would take me and they called it the, a foster program. And it was people that came from the far side of the state over in Western Jersey. And they convinced these people that I would be given uh, the, the chance to continue my education, to have a few dollars in my pocket, and yes, <laughs> teach me, right? I'd get up three o'clock in the morning, jump on a rack buddy truck with the two sons and go pick up milk cans and deliver them to the creameries. We wouldn't get done till 11 o'clock, so we never got to finish school. I never, uh, I was worse off there than I was in a home because I never, even set, I can never remember sitting at their table eating food. <coughs> my, my time was after. When they got done eating, them, the husband, wife, and two sons, whatever was left was given to me. And I asked one day for a piece of, a quarter to get some candy bars. And a guy just pushed the kitchen door shut and he, 22 rifle sat there and said to me, if you could run faster than that thing, I'll give you a quarter. Well, I never said a word, but that night I was gone. <laughs> and I ended up 30 miles away, and some people who was actually a relative of my oldest half-brother took me in, and I thought, oh, well, this was great. Well, it was great to a degree, right? Because I ended up having to go get a job and then had to help him in his moving business. <laughs> and if I made $20 a week, I had to pay them $15 a week. I got a raise, $5 a week, big deal. They wanted that $5. So one day at about 16, I, was, I went down into the little town there when I got done work, and I seen a recruiting office, and I had heard about something about, the, uh, come join the Merchant Marine. Uh, we need people. So I went in there, and the guy, the recruiter, took the information from me, and he said, gee, you don't have a good life at all. I said, no, you think it would be better there? He says, you better believe it. So he said, uh, 
Yeah, I see you only have one eye. At that time, I wore an artificial eye, but uh, it wasn't a good fit. But anyway, he said, uh, we could probably use you as a cook or a mess boy or something. We'll train you. Sign here. So I signed there, and I was still only 16 because I wouldn't be 17 until the middle or the end of July. And he said, I'll see what I can do. I'll do all the pushing I can for you. He said, I know they've taken kids in at 15. So in early in July, I got a call, and the guy said, yep, you're accepted. You're on the list. So I guess it was the end of September, October, I got a call. Be down here, 6 o'clock in the morning. We were put on a train and sent to New York to the Sheepshead Bay Maritime Training Station. And that was a big training station that the Maritime Administration had put up. It was behind the big Coast Guard station. And uh, there we trained for everything. And uh, sometimes a whistle would blow 3 o'clock in the morning and you had to jump out of your sack and go for a lifeboat. And they'd give you training out there in a lifeboat. And you'd learn how to row the boat. And then all of a sudden, the guy would blow a whistle. And somebody in another little boat would throw a match in the water and set it on fire. And another guy would upset the boat. And all you could hear was, there you are, fella. Save yourself. So we learned how to swim in fiery water because we were told that, hey, when it comes, that's that you've got to learn how to get down to the water and how to come up again and push the fire aside and to get a breath of air. Next day we thought, oh well, we're, that's over with. Next day, six o'clock in the morning, just at breakfast time, another alarm would go off and we'd have to get out there and get some gunnery practice. <laughs> and and uh, on it would go. And uh, what, what year? What year? This was in 40, uh, f the end of 44, 45. And uh, we were told that, hey, you've got to learn how to do this because the Navy has gunnery men on these merchant ships, but there are not enough of them. And you may be called upon to assist them. And whether you do it because of <laughs> nature tells you that, hey, your hide is as good as his, you know, and if his goes, you're next or you're going with him. So we learned how to do it. And you'd get on your, when you finally, well, I got, I got to, taught to be a cook and a baker, a second cook and baker, a mess boy, an ordinary seaman, a wiper. I got all these papers. And then the most important one was a lifeboatman. And without that, <laughs> you were nobody. So if you had a lifeboat ticket, you were the guy in charge of a lifeboat too. Plus you had to go out it sometimes two or three times a day, and you had to ram and clean the barrels of the 20 millimeter guns and <laughs> you'd say to a guy how come well those guns were given to the United States by the country of Belgium and they were the poorest steel but there was no guns other than them and they would rust and if there was any rust in that barrel or in the chamber that gun would ex the ammunition would explode in the chamber it wouldn't even get through the barrel so you made sure that you get up there and clean them barrels of the guns, whether they were needed or not, because the day that they were needed, they better be clean. And then you had to go, and even out in the middle of the ocean, go with uh, lifeboat drills and things, put the boats to the water and stuff and whatever. So you learned, it was a good experience, and I learned a lot, and really myself, I became the godson of all those people. I was now 17 years of age, and I'd look around me, and there was 43 crew members on a Liberty ship, 37 on a tanker, and most generally, I would be one of the youngest guys on there. There were guys in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and even 70s that were on those ships, and you'd often wonder, how come? How come you guys are out here? Well, one guy says to me, they didn't want me in the, in the draft. They made me a 4F. So I came out here and done what I have to do. And that's what I would hear all along. So then you'd research it and you'd say, well, during the war, there was a selective service. And here I was too young for the draft anyway. 
but uh, you say, well, how come? They say, well, selective service was between 18 and first 30, and then it was reduced down to 26. And between that period of time, you had to go to your draft board and they would examine you. Except that you had all these supply ships out there and nobody to operate them. So these guys that would be rejected or for some other reason was too young or too old and wanted to do their part, they would join in. For somebody who doesn't know what the Merchant Marine is, what the Merchant Marines are, mm. what's a Reader's Digest version of a merchant marine, if you look into a college dictionary, it tells you that they are the operator of the merchant vessels. <laughs> they, uh, they do the commercial trade. They are the commercial tradesmen. They will take a, a, a shipload of cargo to any given place or various places and then go somewhere else and pick something up and bring it back. And most of the time it would be during the war you would take the supplies to the troops, everything they needed, whether it be medical supplies, ammunition, fuels. Uh, I always add in beer and pretzels because I remember a hole full of beer and we never touched any of it, it didn't belong to us. But uh, this is the way it was. Then we would unload that someplace and then we would go off to another port and pick up a raw material such as bauxite. Many people still don't know how, what the basic of aluminum is. It's bauxite. And you'd go to South America and Chile or something and pick up iron ore or bauxite and bring it back home again. Many people don't realize, and, and it was before my time, it's true. December 7, 1941 was the, the day that the United States entered the war. However, Already in 1939, merchant ships were being pop shot at that by, the, by, by what we now called our enemy. And all through the end of 39, 40s and 41, the ships were being pop shot at that. Uh, Germany had come along and had these little submarines and they would go 8,700 nautical miles on the fuel that they carried and they would come along and they come along the east coast of the United States mainly and they would map out different ports of entry and, and uh, put it on their maps and if they saw a little spike in the water they'd take a pop shot at it and there were uh, tankers going up and down the coast and they'd go to Texas to pick up raw fuel and on the way back boom they were gone there were Oil would come in, parts of ships, and people would say, what the heck is all of that? The government said, oh, they just, that's nothing, you know. That's <laughs> but the big thing was that many of these industries or seashore places along the coastline would keep themselves all lit up. Say Cooney Island would keep all their lights on because they had to do the business. And the government passed an order, to all lights out. No way, it couldn't afford that. But people didn't realize that that light would silhouette some 35 miles out there. And if you had a nice little lake and this little thing stuck up there and a little line item going there and the guy reached up with his periscope and said that, he would come in within distance and he didn't care who it was or whatever. Boom, and that was it. So we lost ships all over the place. December 7th, 1941. A day of reckoning. Many ships, Navy ships, were sunk in Pearl Harbor, right? along with seven merchant ships that were anchored in Pearl Harbor that nobody knew about either, that were loaded with ammunition for the supplies for the people who were stationed in Pearl Harbor. You never heard about that. <laughs> Still today you don't hear it. <laughs> so the merchant ships were commercial yeah, they were commercial vessels, and in 1906, this country instituted what is called the Merchant Marine Act, and this is the govern, governing laws of, that they would have to abide by to, in order to uh, sail under an American flag. 
It was upgraded in 1921 because of World War I. In 1918, they, they instituted it and revised it. But then after the war in 1921, they revised it once more. Then in 1936, when uh, the government, the Congress, knew some of this uprising in, within Europe, in Germany, they revised it once more. And what they included in there is a statement that says that during the time of war or national emergency, the merchant marines shall be an auxiliary branch of the armed forces of the United States. They're, they are to be uh, governed under the act of the uh, U.S. Coast Guard. Their rank, ratings, and, and uniforms and salaries shall be equivalent to that of the U.S. Coast Guard. Now, if you go deeper into it, <laughs> during the time of war, the minute the President of the United States, any president, puts the first letter of his name on a document of war, the United States Coast Guard is automatically the United States Navy. <laughs> in peacetime, they are the Coast Guard. In time of war, they are the Navy. So therefore, we are an auxiliary branch of the, army, of the Navy. Every conceivable ship available would be under the domain of the government. They would be distributed whatever type of vessel between the military units. Every passenger ship or anything of its size would then be turned into being a troop ship operated by merchant seamen, mostly for the U.S. Army Transport Service. Right? You say the Army or the land? Well, that's, that's land. You better believe it. The Transport Service of the U.S. Army. When it comes time to the Navy, then certain ships would be turned over to the U.S. Navy Transport Service to haul some of their things. But how does the Navy operate its vessels? On fuel oil. And how do they get the fuel oil to operate them? By the merchant vessels. And merchant vessels would pull alongside of a cruiser or a carrier or a destroyer and refuel them. <laughs> How would they get the ammunition? The same identical way. Uh, they, either they'd get it offload from one to the other or they'd pull it into a friendly port. Many times uh, a merchant ship, th this country got together with friendly nations such as Guanta in British Guiana. Nobody ever heard of it? We tied up in Guanta, British Guiana with a Liberty ship with supplies that would be stored there for the use of the services. We pulled into a seaport, dropped anchor, and a little gunboat came out, and we thought it was a pilot boat going to take us in. And the guy came on board, and we all stood there and looked at him, dumbfounded, and the guy was telling the captain, the captain asked him, when and where do we tie up? He said, in about three hours, we'll have barges out here to take the docks off of your deck and put them on the top of the I-beams that the sea bees just put in place along the shoreline. And then you can tie your vessel up to that dock <laughs> and unload. So there were things like that. Many people don't know uh, the Seychelles Islands, the 26 islands that lay between Madagascar and Africa. That was a friendly nation. It was actually British rule right, under the Geneva Convention, but it was the first stationary place where radar systems were put in, the dishes were put in place so that the merchant ships could come around the horn and be able to, with the radar that was, that was put on board, some of them, and pick off where the with where the submarines were and get away from them, get a distance, or the destroyer. Many people that do not know that the convoys that would formulate and go in groups and zigzag across the ocean. You can get across the ocean in a 
liberty ship, which has no more than 11 knots in no less than 16 days. But when you zigzag across it, and it takes you 33 days to get there, the reason of the zigzag was to defer the enemy. There would be sometimes 87 vessels in a convoy carrying the needs of the services. The convoy would go and be escorted. Up until the end of 1943, the only escorts that were supplied to the merchant vessels was through the U.S. Coast Guard, right? Branch of the Navy, because Admiral King, who didn't like the Atlantic Ocean, wouldn't supply Navy destroyers. <laughs> until 1943 when they broke the camel's back and they had to. So all of the troop ships that went, the troops were hauled on small vessels up into, out of New York Harbor mainly or in Boston, and went up to Iceland, Greenland, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia on small vessels, taken up to Newfoundland or wherever, and broke up into different uh, military bases that they had all over the place, given additional training, and then they were taken over to, <laughs> the name of the town slips my mind, over in England, which had evacuated this one town and built a new little town, Devon, England. It was laid across the English Channel from Marseille and, and France, Normandy, and the troops would then be taken over there and then again trained over the sides of Liberty ships or the LSTs, taken out into the middle of the English Channel so that they could learn how to offload into the little LSTs to be taken ashore for the Normandy invasion. All right? <laughs> we then had General Eisenhower, and I don't fault to the man, but the actual landing of Normandy was supposedly the 1st or 2nd of June, and he had something else up his sleeve to do, so it didn't happen until the 4th of June or the 6th of June in that area. And when they went to go into the operation, he said, okay, we're going to do it, except they had 30-foot waves out there. There was a big storm come up, and he said, well, that was ideal. That was a big cover because they knew then that the German troops and everything that was on land would exit back inland. But now how do you get there? See? So what they did was some of the merchant ships who had already been regulated and some of them had, had uh, concrete pour it into number three hole so they could be used if necessary. Some of the crews of those would go into the captain's dory, the small lifeboat, go ashore, commandeer the empty barges that the Germans left along the shoreline, pull them back, offload 37 of the merchant ships on the barges, and then ferry these 37 older Liberty ships in and sink them to make the breakwater so that the troops could land while the Germans were back in the hills. So we served the purpose, again, which nobody knew. See, so, so there's all kinds of stories out there that nobody ever knew about. When did, um, prior to the war, were the merchant ships armed, or was that? Uh, well, we, even today, a merchant ship is armed. 122 rifle in the captain's cabin. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, right. So when they started arming the merchant ships in the early, well, mid 40s, uh, many of them even left port with a painted gray telephone pole hanging over the, the bow of the ship as a decoy <laughs> until they could get <laughs> guns on them. And <laughs> it, I guess it scared some of the guys off with a periscope, figured, well, if they got close enough, they get fired upon. And then as they started getting these 350s and 438s and 20 millimeters, and then they said, oh, gee. But the friendliest 
enemy that we had were the Germans, as to the Japanese. The Germans would, the captain of a German submarine, he would get his rank and rating and pay raise and everything by sending information back that he had sunk a ship. But he had to have proof of that. So he had to get close enough to get all of the information that he could from that ship of what it was, or what the name of it was, and the size of it. And the best thing to try and get was the logbook. Well, by the time I went to sea in 45, I would get on my first ship, which was a T2 tanker. And we wore uniforms, similar to the Coast Guard and the Navy, but a, not a bell bottom. And uh, we'd have our sea bag, and we'd have a change of uniform and everything else. And the first thing you would drop the sea bag on the deck, and the guy would say to you, what do you got in there? Well, I got all my gear, my uniforms and stuff. The guy said, I don't know whether you're welcome here. And I would say to him, what do you mean? He said, well, the enemy is out there, you know. And if anything happens to us, I'll be damned if I'm going to get in a lifeboat with you with that uniform. And you'd give it a second thought and you'd say, I agree. Right? Because you'd either get shot or whatever. <laughs> Sitting in there in a uniform. So you had a better chance of just wearing any kind of old clothes, period. And that was the decoy. Uh, unfortunately, it worked for us because, in a way because if you got hit and you were in a lifeboat. Well, the captains, most, most of the captains would go down with their ship because in the, in the peacetime, the captain, he, he bought stock in the company and that would guarantee him his job as a captain of that ship over somebody else. But he was responsible. He was the God. He was the master. That's what, it, that's what his title is. He's the master. He takes orders from nobody other than somebody superior to him. And in time of war, he took his orders from somebody who represented the Navy or the Army, whoever was in the control of that ship, so that he still had to keep his logbook. And the only way the company could collect for damages of that ship, basically, was that logbook be turned in so they could turn it into the government because the government paid them $87,000 for every ship that went down. <laughs> so, but that logbook was equally important to the captain of that submarine. So he would come up and surface and overlook the lifeboats and ask if there were any officers on board because he figured, well, one of the officers would have to have the book. And if nobody had it, well, Sometimes they would just let you go alone, or they'd come up closer. And There were times when an officer who uh, felt he was dedicated, he was a naval reservist, so he wore either his cap or something. And if, even if he couldn't get the book or wouldn't off the book, the captain would then take him as prisoner. On his and, and indoctrinate him and get the information off of him so they could write it down. And they could send that in. Where are you going? How big was your ship? What were you carrying? And where were, you know, this, that, and the other? Indoctrinate him. Well, unfortunately, one of our, our ships, the MS Savoka, was in that same situation. And two good friends of mine, one is still alive, Stanley Wilner, he lives in Florida. And Dennis Rowland, uh, let's see, Stanley was the third mate, and, and Dennis Rowland was the second mate on deck, and they were taken aboard this submarine and indoctrinated. They didn't have the, the logbook. The logbook went down with the ship. But they indoctrinated him. They got as much information out of him as they can. Well, during that course of time, Germany became friendly with Japan. And they would tie in the Japanese submarine captains and the German captains, and sometimes would exchange their prisoners. And that happened with those two unfortunate guys. And they were then put aboard a Japanese submarine because they didn't know how to turn them anywhere else. 
Where were they going to just drop them over the side? The Japanese submarine ran, was running low on fuel and ended up into Singapore to refuel and then turned over those prisoners that they had on there to the inland ground crews. And then they took these two unfortunate guys, along with other guys, to Burma. And these two guys were there for three years helping to build the bridge over the River Kwai. <laughs> and then when they finally were released, <laughs> civilians, they had to find their own way back to the country. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> these are things that people don't really understand, or we don't understand it ourselves. Unfortunately, Dennis Rowland was about 185 pounds, and when he came back to the United States, he weighed about 65 pounds. Oh. And Stanley Wilner had lost a lot of weight, too. And they were two of the guys who banded together. We always believed in the Merchant Marine, and we knew that in 1945, President Roosevelt had signed a decree, and he said that the men of the Merchant Marine were entitled to the same benefits that the other people were entitled to. He had drafted a similar bill under the GI Bill of Rights to include the Merchant Marine. And unfortunately, he died. And Harry Truman became the then president overnight. And Harry Truman reviewed this document, and he apparently agreed with it. But you see, the only thing a president can do <laughs> is sign the document once it goes through the procedure. And it wasn't for years that we, that we realized, what is that procedure? We were just average Americans doing our job. And we felt, we were always told that, oh, we're going to get our veteran status. And I still remember in 1946, I went to see till 49. But in 46, I still remember hearing that phrase that we would be designated as veterans for our service. <laughs> A bill gets introduced, even in this state today. That bill is introduced and sponsored and co-sponsored. It is then reviewed and is sent on to committees and the committee researches it, and the committee decides what it's going to cost the state, what it's going to cost this or that or the other, and what is all inclusive in it. Once it has gone through that procedure, then it is called for a vote. So what Harry Truman did was present this document to the, the two large veterans organizations known at the time in the United States. And that was the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States of America and the American Legion. And said to them basically, here, assist these people to get the same rights that they are entitled to. Whether those people just didn't understand the procedures or ignored the procedures, the statement that I got back was that they felt that if under the GI Bill of Rights, all these veterans had all these benefits coming to them. And if another group were put into it, where's the money coming from? And they didn't want to have to give up what they already had to share with anybody else. And rather than assist them, were the biggest detriment to, to them. They are organiz one organization, the VFW today, still spreads all kinds of rumors that the Merchant Marine were nothing but a bunch of drunks, derelicts, slackers, draft dodgers, and so on. And that is the biggest fallacy going. Wasn't, I heard somewhere statistically there were percentage-wise more merchant marines lost. Oh, yes. We thought that it was one of every 22, or one of every 32. And uh, <laughs> we, that was larger, that was the second only to the Marine Corps. 
And it turned out being even that was wrong because many foreign companies, uh, countries' ships such as Norway, who had some ships left, uh, Panama, and you name a few of these other foreign countries, they assisted America and was willing to help us. However, they didn't have enough of merchant seamen qualified to run these ships. So they asked the United States, could you help us to supply some of these people? And we willingly assisted them. We gave them the qualified people, whether it was on deck or in the engine room or in the steward's department, maybe not as many there, but they had to have people who were qualified to run the engine room and to run the sextons and see that. So when, when things happened to those ships, they didn't keep the records like Americans did. <laughs> and, and we found later that there were so many went down on these foreign ships that the number increased to one of every 25 merchant seamen. American merchant seamen had lost their life doing their job. And there were over 11,000, 12,000 or more even that were maimed, never, could never go back to sea. And they had to be replenished. <laughs> what did the Merchant Marine consist of in World War II? 250,000 plus volunteers. All volunteered but one. And <laughs> who was he? He was a retired admiral of the U.S. Navy, Emory Scott Land, who had been in the Navy, served his time, and he went to MIT even and learned the architectural design of shipbuilding and what it took to put a ship together. And uh, he retired in 1937, and within 15 days of his retirement, uh, in 1937, President Roosevelt commandeered him and drafted him to be the Commandant of the Merchant Marine. And he and <laughs> John Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy, who was at the time the uh, ambassador to Great Britain, were sent over to England to look over some blueprints. England was under attack by Germany. Germany was bombarding their shipyards and they had no way to replace their ships. And they asked the United States, would you build us some ships? We have blueprints of them. So these two gentlemen were sent over there to see what they had and whether we could do it over here in this country. And when they came back, Admiral Land told the President and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, if they want these ships built, I'll build them for you, but there's nothing but big bathtubs. They requested that the United States build them 50 of them and, they, and asked for assistance in other ways in between. So the United States agreed that they would build 50 of these Liberty ships, big bathtubs, for England. We would either take them over there and then bring our own crews back, or they can send the people and they can take them back. And in the meantime, the United States gave England 50 World War II destroyers so that they could have to use to protect their coastlines and their ships and convoys. Well, while they were building these 50 ships along the East Coast, the Gulf Coast off of Florida or the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico, we were losing merchant ships left and right. And they put in a request to England, could we build some of them for ourselves? And England said, yes, you helped us, we help you. Well, then, mister, <laughs> you have to have people to man them. So that Admiral Land was then designated, they set up, the, they enhanced the Maritime Commission. He became the, the chairman of the Maritime Commission. He, they set up the, uh, under the first war act of World War I, or 1941, the uh, uh, 
War Shipping Administration, and he became the chairman of that. And then he became the head of the organization known as the United States Maritime Service. And this was the training program. They put out the ships for bid, and there were something like 13 bids that were put in. And the final bid that was opened up said it gave a value on each ship that that would be built for the government. And underlined it said that the government would not have to pay one penny until we could build the ships faster than the enemy could sink. And the guy that drew up that contract won it. And he was Henry J. Kaiser <laughs> of Kaiser Aluminum in Spokane, Washington. And they started building these ships. The first Liberty ship came off the ways in 150 days or thereabouts. And they built 2,117 of them. And the last one that came off the ways was built in 15 days, three hours, and 15 and a half minutes. And it was being loaded and sent to <laughs> on its way. Wow. They were put together and built throughout the United States and various places and shipped uh, to 18 different shipyards all over the country and then assembled. And uh, some of them worked and some didn't. And they, they were welded, most of them, and they found that the high seas controlled everything. And every once in a while, one would get out there and they, they were welded at the number three hold of the housing and uh, to midships. And if the ship would come up in the air and slam down, the weld would break, and there you had the bow going one way and the stern the other. So then they devised an insurance cable <laughs> and the cern of the ship would have to, if he was lucky enough to have it, he would try and chase after the bow, and so on. And then they came along and they uh, welded a strap around some of them, and, and, and they expanded on it as well. In convoys, every ship in the convoy would have to have major, one major replaceable part of that ship, whether it was a propeller, or an insurance cable, or <laughs> extra boom, or something else. I was on one where <laughs> we lost a propeller because when there was no governor on the ships, the guy had to slow it down when they felt or the the, the told them that to slow it down. So they tried to slow it down, and when the bow would go down in the water, the stern would come up, and the propeller would go and so fast it would shake itself loose. So we ended up having having the propeller, the spare propeller on the ship. And what they had to do was take number four booms, take them off, strap them to number five booms, first get the propeller off of the front of the back housing and take it around. And I ended up in a posted chair hollering up with a megaphone to the left, to the right, and slipping it on. Unfortunately, all propellers weren't made the same. And we ended up making more speed going in reverse than we did forward. And <laughs> but it worked. Then we got to a shipyard and they fixed it some way. So these are the kinds of things that you put up with. And, and, but I, I decided that, I, I always said to these guys, look, you made me the, the man that I am. And I'll never forget you for it. We went on when we got back and we figured, well, in 1977, Barry Goldwater, then a senator from Arizona, he had introduced a bill that would give the women pilots their veteran status. And they were the women who flew these little planes along the East Coast and hop, skipped, and jumped all over the place. They actually were civilians working for the Air Corps, the Army Corps, and they would hop them over to these places. 
Unfortunately, 16 of them lost their lives doing it. And he most worthily put a bill through that gave those people of that service their veteran status. And that's when we started waking up to the fact that, look, how come they get this here? And what we did, we didn't get. So somebody reviewed it, and they found within that, and there was a paragraph that said, and any other organization that done uh, believed that they were entitled to, they had the right to apply. And that's when Mr. Wilner, Stanley Wilner, and, and uh, several of them got together and were able to get a bill in, and <laughs> it started the process. Well, that was 1977. <laughs> and like government, it has to go through this, that, and the other. And congressmen would say, well, yeah, we agree that uh, let's hear from these other services. So they would call at, and they would go through motions and meetings and little hot-headed this, that, and the other, and they would get put aside again. And finally, in 1987, 1986, 87, we were, I always knew myself that you can't sue government and get any place. Government has sovereign immunity. <laughs> Except that sovereign immunity doesn't co cover embarrassment. So these fellows attempted to sue the United States government. And it was all spelt out. And rather than allow that to go public, the government then set up a three federal judge panel to review it. And the panel would call in in Washington, D.C. District Court and call all these services in and ask them, what do you think they did? What do you think they did? Do you think they're worthy of this, that, or the other? Well, when it came down to it, the one that broke the camel's back was the Air Force. They agreed that had it not been for the Merchant Marine, they wouldn't have had the fuel to fly the planes. They wouldn't have had the bombs to to drop or anything else. So the judge who was still, excuse me, still alive today, Judge Oberdoffer, gave his ruling. And he gave them two weeks to come back with a date and say, if you believe that these people, just give the clerk of the court the date and we will proceed with it. Well, somebody said, well, we're finally going to get our veteran status. So don't make any waves. So we didn't make any waves and the bill passed except that when it came out into the public that on January 19th, 1988, we were granted our veteran status, it only gave it to us till August 15th, 1945. And we said, how come? The war wasn't over in 1945. Well, the answer we got back and was a smart answer. If you believe it to be different, then go back to Congress and have them change it because we had found that both Congress and signed into law by President Truman a proclamation, 2714, which designated December the 31st, 1946 as the end of hostilities and the end of World War II for all services, which would have included us. So why weren't we given? So we got bills put in, and there again, we're scattered all over the place, all over the country, handfuls of people, not knowing how government works, not knowing the procedure, and a bill would be introduced. Well, some people would get it, start going through committees, and you get up to the last day that something could be done, uh, didn't work. The bill is good for two years, have it resubmitted, it'll automatically be, it was it automatically submitted over five times, H.R. 44. Finally, that bill ran out, and we got a new one in. <laughs> and we started the same procedure. And it started working in the same way. Finally, I just said, this, this is crazy. How do we get information? I'd write letters to congressmen or this, that, and the other. It took me three days to get them a letter out to them. Probably it took a week for one of their aides to read it. 
and three days to get back to me, and I, oh yeah, I could support this thing and that, that, that. I said, that's crazy. I said to the wife, I said, you know, I hear this computer age, and I hate computers. Let's go out and see what the heck we can do. So I went to a place and I told the guy what I tried to do, and I said, I'm a really computer dummy. I don't want the cheapest computer. I don't want the most expensive computer. Give me something that as I learn, it'll still be there with me. So I picked up this computer and I started looking through how to work it. And I'd get in contact with other people and they'd say, do this, do that, do the other. And if you look at this, you'll find that. You'll look. Finally, it got to the point where, all right, we got a bill in. And how many, we got somebody to support it. How many people are co-sponsors? And you'd find out the number. And then you gotta find out how many people does it take to do anything? And there were 435 congressmen, so that means that at least 218 would have to sign on to this bill before it can go anywhere. But it would have to go through a certain committee first. And through two sessions of Congress, we were hung up that the bill, one bill we had in on the House side got 313 co-sponsors and hadn't went any place. Wasn't agendized anywhere. So I got into this Thomas legislative website and I started asking the Polish questions. You know, that stupid little question. What does it take? Well, it has, it's, it's caught up in the Veterans Affairs Committee. Well, there you sit. Two days later, you'd get into the thing, and you'd say to the guy again, well, could you give me the names of these committee people? So the guy would, half hour later, I'd have the names of the 25 people on the committee. And the chairman of the committee was Bob Stump from Arizona, a big Navy veteran. But also, you gotta be a little bit knowledgeable, and I've put two and two together, that's where Barry Goldwater came from, I said to the guy. Barry Goldwater put that original bill through that we originally got out, and somebody has it in for us. We, Merchant Marine, want to be attached, or got attached, to an Air Force bill. And somebody has it in for us. So I would get in, and then somebody said to me, well, there's 800 numbers that you can get through congressmen. So I found one of them, and I started circulating that number around, and people would start making calls and things like that. And finally, one day, we were told that the number didn't work no more. It's been discontinued. <laughs> I was able to trace it that it was an 800 number sponsored by the VFW, <laughs> and they got a bill for $7,000 for the people who were using it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and when they found out who was using it, they shut it off. So then what do you do next? So I got back into it and I started going through this thing. And I finally got through some of these congressmen who were on this committee and I would get the political answer. If that bill comes before me, I would support it. If. Right? Then I got into this site again and I said to the guy, who has the control? The chairman of that committee, of any committee, has a complete control of what goes on that agenda. And Mr. Stump would not introduce that to his committee. So this congressman from Texas told me, he said, I cannot tell you how to break the camel's back. I'll give you one of my aides. So the aide got on the phone and she said, do you know who sponsored that bill? I said, yes. You know who sponsored the bill on the Senate side? Yes. I would get a hold of them. And who do you represent? I said, I am co-chairman of the American Merchant Marine Fairness Committee on the West Coast. She said, tell them who you are and who you represent and request that they file a petition against Mr. Stump in your name. So I did it. And it worked. It worked so much that the gal told me, this is going by fax down to Arizona. In an hour's time, they should have it, and you call them and find out whether they've got it. And if they didn't, then get back to me, and I'll have it resent. And 
when I called down there, this young lady said, oh, Mr. Smith, yes, it just came in off the wire. And let me explain it to you, and, and I don't want to put the girl on the carpet. She says to me, it's eight pages long, and we want to make sure that it's filled out properly, because I can tell you this much. This is only the second time in the history of this country that it's ever been done. So can you call me within a week? And I called her in a week, and uh, she said to me, how many people do you have on the bill? I said, well, the last count I had was 313. She said, well, you only needed 218. But unfortunately, Mr. Stump has us sending in-house emails to all Republican congressmen urging him not to sign that bill. So she says, you'd have to get across. They'd have to cross sides and t for you to get the 218. So when I got that message, I called back to these two people in Illinois and in Mississippi, and they said to me, what? Repeat that so I can put it on tape. I got a call three hours later that Mr. Stump was called back into Washington, D.C. for the next morning. And then it, <laughs> they, they reconvened the, the committee, and the committee approved. And, it, and then it, they told me, and the thing that saved us was that this thing that was going on with Bill Clinton investigation it was holding Congress up. And it was to our advantage, really, because it didn't have a final agenda for the act of Congress. <laughs> and the gal in, in, at both sides, at, at uh, Trent Lott's office and the one in Lane Evans' office, told me that we're going to have it presented into a bill. Do you have C-SPAN, too? I said, no. Well, do you know anybody? I said, yeah, some guy in Florida. So I got a hold of that guy, and I said, watch C-SPAN, too. Bill number so-and-so is going to be introduced, and our bill is amended to it. Well, unfortunately, the guy called me back maybe 5 o'clock at night and says, ah, we lost it again. Next morning, I called up. Oh, Mr. Schmidt, I was just about to call you. Mr. Specter and Mr. Bird from Virginia or West Virginia uh, didn't like something in that bill and we were wised up to it, so we pulled the amendment off of it before it got called and defeated. And we, had, we called Mr. Stump in, and he agreed to have it attached to 4110, <laughs> the enhancement bill. <laughs> and when it was, the roll was called, 423 congressmen signed on to it. Boy, it took that long. Yeah. So that was 10 years after the fact. And now you got a bill? No way. Even here. A bill is approved, but now it must be signed either by the governor or the, the mayor or the administrator or the president, right? And you want to find out how long is this going to take? So you get back in, you ask this Polish question, and the guy says to me in, out in type, he has three options. He can sign it or he doesn't sign it and it automatically becomes law in 30 days or he can veto it. I said, well, now, that's, thank you for the options. How do I find this out what his intention is? He said, here's his email address, send it one. So I sent, it took three email messages. And finally, the bill had passed in October the 21st, 1999. And on Halloween, November the 31st, he had 10 days to sign a letter of intent, and the president signed the letter of intent. And then on Veterans Day of that year, he signed it into law. It's all right to sign a bill into law, but now it go, it's got to get a public law number to become the law of the land. So I got back in again. I said to the guy, how long does it take to get a public law number? He said, what are you referring to? I said, to this bill. Oh, he said, that could take up to 90 days. I said, well, in 90 days, we could lose another 100 men. Is it possible that it could be pushed up? In seven days, I had public law number. So sometimes things like that work. Some, and I, I said, some guy said, oh, it's probably. I said, yeah, I know. I, uh, how do you know? I said, well, never mind. 
So I, it's done. I guess part of the moral of that story is, is that merchant marines are awfully stubborn. Oh, yes. Persistence prevails. What you believe in, you stick with. And you don't falter. I've always told people, and, and some people say, oh, I know the truth. Well, you may think you know the truth. But the truth, I was taught in this orphanage. We had 175 kids. And there were no liars amongst us. Because the truth is the truth, and it can be told 90,000 or a million 90,000 times the same way. You may not believe it. But you see, the minute you alter that truth, it's no longer truth. And then that gets carried to somebody else. So I stick with the truth. The truth is the truth is the truth. And that's, I don't falter. <laughs> and that's what these guys, I said, that's right. Let me, I got to switch tapes here in just a second. <laughs> so I, no, I don't want to take your time. Because the, the Merchant Marines are kind of this interesting thing, too, because not only were you a part of the Navy, but you also interfaced with um, the Armed Guard, didn't you? Oh, yes. And they yeah. kind of faced... Oh, yes. Yeah. The Armed faced. Guard were... Uh, in 1995, on the Intrepid, there was an admiral of the Navy who was picked to speak at the Memorial Day ceremony on the Intrepid, which was anchored or tied up in New York Harbor. And there were going to be thousands of people on it. Well, when he got his thing that this is what you, we want you to speak on, the auxiliary branches of the U.S. Navy. Well, he went down the list and he found armed guard. And he said to the aide who went out to do the research, who the hell is the armed guard? What are they, the keepers of the brig? Well, when he found out different, he spoke for 33 minutes. In the first 22 minutes, he had to publicly apologize to the people that he was speaking to, and many of them didn't even know what the hell he was talking about. That finally he got an education of what the hell the armed guard was. They were the U.S. Navy armed guard gunners, and they were also used in World War I on the merchant ships, not as greatly as they were in World War II. But a merchant ship... A Liberty ship would have a crew of 43 to 47 of merchant crew. And then it would have anywhere from 12 to 25 armed guard gunners. But then the same ship would have possibly 18 to 20 various types of guns in place on it. And each of the guns, even a 20 millimeter, would take no less than three people to operate that gun. One person pulled the trigger, another person loaded it, but another person would have to bring the ammunition up. Right? Now, what happens when something happens to one of those guys? Interesting enough, I just got this here, today's mail, and this is the way I get my information. <laughs> that, that, uh, it states about in February 1942, the Navy issued instructions addressed to the Merchant Marine and the Armed Guard gunnery officers. These orders removed what had been up till the point a defensive posture under the guns, uh, uh, under which the guns were to be employed only upon attack. The gunnery officer of February 1942 read, there is no situation where either the master or armed guard commander should delay opening, opening fire on the enemy. And then it goes on to tell you that in, 19, in December 31st, 1942, the Chief Naval, Office, Naval Operations Instructions of December the 25th were further clarified by a statement that cases of discipline, including refusal of merchant seamen to obey naval orders or the orders of their officers was to be dealt with by exceptionally military court or by federal civil authority. There were 117 merchant seamen that were court-martialed by the military, and we were always considered as civilians, and you don't court-martial a civilian. <laughs> so, so there took the, the bite out of it all, you see. So, so 
these people, you know, these are things that are hidden somewhere, and finally somebody brings it about. And uh, it's, it's uh, in 1942, U.S. Navy's instructions to merchant ship masters ordered that assistant gunners and ammunition handlers from the merchant crews were to supplement the assigned naval armed guards. Under such instructions, and on a typical liberty ship or tanker with a crew of 37 men, this required when the battle station, when at battle stations, that 16 so-called civilian seamen were to be assigned as assistant gunners, leaving the 12 merchant seamen available as ammunition handlers, since nine officers and men was a minimum crew required to keep the ship steaming ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, did, did you have armed guard on your ship? Oh yes. yes. Now did because uh, I know the armed guard. I, a, a friend of mine that I interviewed, uh, her father was armed guard, and they weren't considered RN. Uh -huh. So they had a little spat with with the quote RN. What about the armed guard and the merchant marines? Did you guys get along? At first, there there were differences. Uh, early on, about the time when I come on. Much of it was only individualized then, but most of them, we worked hand in hand. Uh, when even in drills, you see, the ammunition wasn't exposed for the guns. You couldn't leave it on deck. It would be washed overboard or be destroyed. So every available spot, including the chain locker, had ammunition stored. And if somebody, even the whim of uh, possibility of needing it, the alarm would go off, and me as a, a cook or a mess boy would run up to the, <laughs> the chain locker and bring ammunition up and place it wherever it had to be. Or you'd go aft and bring it up, or you'd go down in this one hole and bring up the ammunition. And we worked hand in hand. If something happened, the, oh, Stephen Hopkins, there was a, uh, it was a Liberty ship, and this was a, uh, a cadet, a merchant marine cadet out of the uh, U.S. Maritime Academy up in Kings Point, New York. That was the only, this is the only service where a cadet would have to actually serve on a ship for one year before he got his rating. You don't do that in the Navy. <laughs> well, on this particular ship, it was under attack by this battleship, German battleship, and the ship was being sunk, but the last man still alive and able to fire the gun was able to, to aim it at the right spot at that battleship and sink it. So this is the only academy that can fly that battalion flag, even over the Navy. <laughs> so, and they resent that, but that was given by Congress. So we worked hand in hand, and uh, they, they had losses, oh, I think they lost 1,800 men or something out of their group. But uh, the average Navy guy, you say, the, the armed guard, they don't even know what you're talking about. Guy on a ship today, I was somewhere the other day, and I handed a guy, oh, we were over at Silverdale yesterday. And there was a guy, I could tell he was, had just come out of the service because he still had that haircut. Him and his wife and the two kids, and I had still one of my cards with me. And I said to the guy, uh, you look like a Navy guy. He said, yeah, I just got out. I said, uh, you might be interested in this. Look through this here and you'll find all kinds of Navy sites linked onto it. Jesus Christ, he said. <laughs> I said, do you know who the armed guard was? Who the hell are they? He said, I put 17 years in the Navy. He said, and I don't even know who the hell they are. <laughs> so, wow. So, and, and I, I went into a shoe store looking for where my wife had went, and there was a kid sitting in the back, and, and I'm just that brazen guy. And the kid says, can I help you? I said, no, I'm looking for my wife. She was in here looking for shoes. Oh, nobody here. So I, I said to him, uh, you, be, you might be interested. You look at the age that you, you know your history? And the kid says, what do you mean? I handed him a card. I said, do you know uh, what year the U.S. Navy came about? No. He said, early? I said, yeah. Does it sound like about 1882 or 26 or whatever? He said, yeah. Well, that was the U.S. Navy, I said. Oh, yeah. I said, did you ever hear of the Continental Navy of 1775? Huh? 
<laughs> I said, read this. Had it not been for the mariners of the Revolutionary War, Washington would have never advanced on the British because the British Navy had most of its battleships up in Maine, Bangor, off of Bangor, Maine, and whatever. And a merchant vessel couldn't leave port without them boarding it and finding out where they were going, what they were carrying. They didn't want to you to deliver something to some foreign nation or whatever. So they got fed up with it. And one rainy night, for, from what I gather, some of them got into this little rowboat, and they must, the English must have been having a little tea party, and they boarded this little gunboat out there and bashed the hell out of all of the crew and then turned the gunboat and destroyed three of the British Navy vessels. <laughs> and, and for that, of course, then they hated all merchant vessels. Then the Continental Congress issued a decree from a letter of Marquis de France, which gave any merchant vessel the right to board any ship. Yeah, right. you gotta keep. Let me, we're running out of a little time here, yeah. so I got one last question. And having gone through World War II and having been a part of World War II, do you think there's a message that should be left with the great, great, great grandchildren that you'll never meet, the future generations, that it's just going to be history in a book? Do you, do you think there's a message for them? Uh, this day and age, messages mean little to anybody because nobody goes into it. Even in the schools today, you'll only find two paragraphs in a, in a history book of kids of anything about World War II. And uh, other wars come, uh, and uh, what message would you give? The Vietnam era war, MIAs. Well, I could push MIAs. 8,764 merchant seamen are MIAs at the bottom of the seven seas. Nobody ever went after them. <laughs> the skeletal remains are all gone anyway. But it's, it's a shame that people have to fight with each other to get anything. Because somehow, some way with this atomic age, somebody's going to push the wrong button. And those who were disbelievers might better hope that they're not the remaining bunch. Because there's going to be nothing left for them to do. Because, uh, so... World War I was the world to end wars. World War II came, and we're never going to have another one. And then we went on and on and on. I just got into a site, Somalia. Well, there were merchant ships in Somalia. If, if they hadn't been over there, the troops wouldn't have had anything. In Vietnam era, the uh, SS Baton Rouge victory, it had a load of ammunition in it. And what the, what the government would do so that they wouldn't have to pay the merchant mariners a bonus to be in a certain zone, they would anchor that ship seven miles out until the ammunition was needed. Then they would definitely bring the ship in. Well, the Cambodians or whatever got out there and put these plastic bombs around it, and then somebody on shore just pushed the button, and 44 men went to their death. Vietnam Wall, 5,800 names were on that wall. Less 44. Those people who operate that or have the control of it still won't put those names on that wall. And the principal holder of that is Ted Turner. He donated over $5 million for the traveling wall, and he seems to have the control of it. So, what, what do you think? What do you think the Merchant Marines meant to World War II? <laughs> Without the Merchant Marine, the war would have went an entirely different direction. We would not have won that war without them. And not because I was a member of it. But you take, even, you know, every year in early February, I've been to a, several of the ceremonies of the early on in February, 3rd of February, 
the SS Dorchester. It was an old passenger ship, and it was turned over to the Army Transport Service. And there were 973 troops on board of it. And you ever hear the story of the four chaplains when the ship, the Coast Guard cutters were the destroyer escorts for it. However, when the submarine finally hit this ship, over 500 of the troops were thrown into the water. And the chaplains decided that they would go down with the ship. And it was honorable of them, commended for them. The Coast Guard cutters had these depth charges. They could have sunk that submarine. But out of the, for the respect of the people in the water, they didn't use them because it would have been havoc and they would have been had to take them to task for it. And there are all big services every year. However, the people seem to forget there again that 102 merchant seamen went down with it that operated the ship, never got a bit of credit for whatever they did. And 11 Navy armed gunners went down with the ship. So it's unfortunate that this happened but these are the things that I always say anymore. We are America's forgotten veterans. We, stories are said that we made all kinds of money. Well, whatever money I made, I paid taxes on. Anybody in the service during World War II paid no taxes. Uh, anybody in the military service in World War II had a $10,000 life policy on them with a beneficiary of their choice. And if anything would ever happen to one of them, the beneficiary then would collect the $10,000. Plus they had the right to go to any kind of a, a hospital facility or get their medical and this, that, and the other. Merchant seamen had a policy on them and we didn't realize, we, oh, we were told, you got a $5,000 policy. <laughs> Somebody got it uh, under the, cover somewhere. It was written by the Lloyds of London and it said that in the end in fine print that in order for anybody to collect they would have to produce a carcass. <laughs> so three women had applied and three women collected and three years later the government sued them for everything they had. <laughs> so not another soul even attempted because they lost more than they could have ever gained. So when you're at a veterans an event you stand there and you see that American flag. I'm proud. But I believe it. Had it not been for the Merchant Marine, that flag wouldn't be flying. And that's not a discredit to all the other people. But think of how many of them would have never made it. You know, you get into a site and there's a big tank site and the guy's showing pictures of tanks and everything. So I would just, not sarcastically, I would just say to him, can you tell the people how that tank got there? <laughs> and they jokingly get back and they say, thank God for you guys. Can I link your site on? So, and that's what I try and do. I say, we're an equal where you may think that even after all these years, we're trying to put ourselves above you. No way. I want you as an equal. And that's when I got down on that World War II memorial, and I don't want to say this guy is still in office. And I wanted this one cubicle that a guy says to me, who the hell gives a hoot about the World War II people? None of them want to put anything up. I said, I'll never let you forget it. And he happened to get himself named to that committee. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, uh, actually, the Merchant Marines were there before, were there oh, during, and after. and after. We were the ones that took them over there, and we were the ones that brought them home. I come out of Antwerp, Belgium, and I don't even know the name of the ship. I couldn't even tell you the, f the first name of half of the guys that I sailed with, because most of them got called by some other name. I never got called Harold. I never got called Frank. I never got called Schmidt or Smitty. I was always Cookie or <laughs> something else because there was always somebody else there before me with that name. But we come out of Antwerp, Belgium, 
563 or 568 troops in number three hole. Number three hole had been done over and put these portable rack bunks, collapsible bunks. And they had their own galley down there that they could cook in a mess hall and things like that. And these troops would, you'd go in there and you'd bring them back out and bring them home. We went into New York. The bands were playing, the people out there saluting them and flags are waving for those 568 guys. Nobody could care less about them guys that brought them back. We were nobody. That was, we were our job. We were getting big pay for that. <laughs> yeah. We come out of Antwerp, Belgium, and there were still these mines floating around. And I had to stand and watch. I, don't know, I guess I was a mess boy or cook, whatever. But uh, the guy said to me, hey, go up there and stand and watch. Here's a rifle. If you see anything, ring the bell and let them know up on the bridge so they can dodge it. And I said to the guy that was on the other side, I guess I was on port side, he was on the starboard, and I said to him, what the hell are we looking for? He said, well, if you see any of them green things out there, let them know. And I said to the guy, you mean one of them? And he said, yeah. Well, what the hell, if I'd have rang the bell, we'd have ran right into the goddamn thing. So I just, boom. Guy said, I didn't think you could shoot like that. I said, I didn't either. <laughs> I said, that guy was, was up there with me. So... You know, I was on another ship. We went to Lorient, France. You ever hear of Lorient, France? No. You don't know the history of Lorient? Where do you think the, the Germans built all their submarines once they took France over? There was nine millimeters thick concrete down it. <laughs> and when they would commandeer another country's submarine, they would take it in there, put it up in the dry dock, and they would have their crew converting everything into English. So we had to go there. We didn't know. We went to Brest, France, then we went to Lorient. What the hell are we doing here? I don't know. We had to go with the captain, and the captain says, well, you guys go off here somewhere. So somebody represented each of the departments. And we went up on the hill there, and the guys, the Frenchmen, we thought it was the Frenchmen stomping the grapes in the barrel. It was the German prisoners that they had taken out of, out of that thing, and they were stomping the grapes. So then we had to go in there, and the old man would say, the captain, the old man, he'd say, yeah, all right. He said, I want you to watch what I'm doing. I said, what the hell are you going to do? You know? And he said, well, everything is in the safe. We got all the records. We'll put them in this big wall safe, and we're going to fix it that nobody can open it. So he just took his pistol out, and we all stood back, and he shot at it so it wouldn't, nobody could operate it anymore. And that's where they got the records then, see? And so, then we got back on the ship and come home. <laughs> so all kinds of things. It, it sounds like they can try to keep your benefits. They can try to not give uh -huh. all these things. But <laughs> they can't take that pride away. That no. For no. It took me years before I found out that I could go to a VA facility for medical attention. If you're in a service, and I knew one guy, and God forbid, I, I can't even think of his name. He was in the Marines. He shot himself in the foot, got a purple heart for it. And <laughs> it's on record that he got shot. Merch Marine, you could get your guts blown out. There's no records of it. So anyway, you say, well, I, I got with Patty Murray. I got with this one. Norm Dix, excuse the expression, ain't worth the room he takes up, to my part. He's a big Navy man, but uh, it, it took me three years before I finally convinced him to vote for our bill. Right. Uh, Patty Murray, 